So uh, I was at the um, vigil, uh, the candlelight vigil the other night uh, here in town in Ithaca, the night of the non-indictment. Anybody else out there outside the courthouse? Yeah. Um, and uh, there was a split in the group, the participants in this uh, candlelight vigil. It was a split between those who were sort of remain in the circle of the vigil. Uh, and there were other demonstrators who wished to engage in direct action by blocking uh, traffic, some of the main arteries in and out of, uh, of Ithaca as an expression of the uh, outrage and dissent, right, that is non, uh, not indictment. Uh, so later that night and uh, throughout the rest of the, 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 throughout the following day, there were heated debates that unfolded uh, on the internet. Um, Ithaca uh, liberals, by and large, and a few radicals, debated the quote unquote effectiveness uh, of the protests, various aspects of the protests. And there was much hand wringing and teeth gnashing over the fact that some folks who had gone into the street. Uh, in order to disrupt traffic. And most of the comments were to this effect. I thought this was supposed to be a peaceful protest. <laughs> the people who blocked the streets were just hurting their own cause. They're just going to alienate potential allies. Self-destructive. And this is just a milder version, uh, by the way, of the kinds of arguments uh, that are used, that have been used, and are being used to dismiss and disparage the people's uprising on the streets of Ferguson. Uh, but I think it's important to respond to these arguments because almost all of us harbor some of these outlets, or at least more or less sympathetic. Is that correct? That's the question. So I want to talk a little bit about Ferguson and the fallacies of the management class. Ferguson and the fallacies of the management class. Middle class liberals tend to misdiagnose social problems. And as a result, they prescribe the wrong solutions, or at least they prescribe inadequate solutions. Sometimes they even aid the enemy. Sensitivity training. Cameras on caps. Residential requirements for police. These are the kind of reforms that liberals tend to advocate. Why do we do this? We, the petite bourgeoisie. Right? That means you too. Right? Don't matter where you come from, what your class background is, point is you're here. You're headed on a certain trajectory. Is that correct? So when I say the petite bourgeoisie, I'm talking about me, I'm talking about you. <laughs> so we've been trained to reproduce the system. And, and when the system's utter corruption is exposed, we experience a collective crisis. And as a result of our training, our conditioning, we struggle to manage the system more effectively and thus to simultaneously <laughs> and thus to simultaneously rationalize and preserve it. Rationalize and preserve that system. As we do so, we demonstrate our adherence to a number of myths or fallacies, right? The fallacies of the management class. The myth of respectability, right? Respectability politics, if I just act a certain way, if I dress a certain way, if I talk a certain way, if I carry myself a certain way, then I will be exempt from what happened to Mike Brown. Furthermore, I will be exempt from the kind of things that people are saying about the people who are in the streets resisting what happened to Mike Brown because I don't want to be associated with them. The myth of respectability. 
the fallacy of dialogue and moral suasion. We just need to have a dialogue. We need to talk this out. Right? We just got, we have to come to some kind of agreement. The facade of civility, right? And as we talk this out, as we engage in dialogue, the most important thing is that we not lose our temper. Right? Because this is illegitimate. These expressions of outrage, of anger, are illegitimate. Everybody knows we have to bottle that up and engage in civil discourse. Militancy and expressions of outrage. We disavow and reject disruption and confrontation as illegitimate and uncouth and self-defeating. We do not realize as our prophets have been telling us, that peace is not the absence of conflict, it is the presence of justice. So there's a basic misapprehension of the nature of social movements and the nature of social change. We are taught, even in a fancy place like Cornell, we are taught a version of social movements that suggests that reform is inherent in the American democratic institutions, that progress, greater inclusion, Decreasing discrimination are the inexorable products of our liberal democracy. That change is a process broken by charismatic men on behalf of mute, long-suffering populations, and that all of this happens only with the aid of a benevolent state and other elite actors. Uh, that narrative erases and distorts much, but one of its principal erasures is the reality of confrontation and the necessity of confrontation politics. So I submit to you that we need to examine ourselves, that we need to critique ourselves. What is the nature of our investment in the status quo? Why are we so invested in the status quo? What roles does class play? What roles does ideology play? Why are we so afraid of confrontation, of disruption? What are we protecting? What are we trying to preserve? Police terror and political responses to it have distinct class dimensions. The liberal petit bourgeoisie, including the black and brown petit bourgeoisie, tend to prescribe what I call technocratic solutions. That is to say, they tend to look to formally credentialed experts, which is myself, <laughs> got a degree, <laughs> who they assume will leverage their expertise to devise solutions or to ameliorate the problem. Right? This is why I'm up here. That degree I'm supposed to tell you what to do. <laughs> you guys sit there and listen to me. We delude ourselves. The petit bourgeoisie is invested in the system because it derives status and material benefits from the system. We attempt to negotiate with a system that has demonstrated time and time again its utter disdain for the sanctity of black life. Not only its disdain, its disdain rather, but its deep commitment to slaughtering black and brown people. To be very clear about what's going on. One every 28 hours, dead black bodies in the street is the sacrifice America makes to the gods of white supremacy. Yet, the petit bourgeoisie, including black and brown folks, stands on the sidelines mumbling, asking white supremacy to please crack fewer heads. The vanguard of the insurgency. Who are the vanguard? The vanguard insurgents. Poor people and many workers tend to be more skeptical of the capacity of the system to reform itself, and for good reason. They are the primary victims of the contradictions of capitalism, including the contradictions of police occupation. You are occupied and colonized and brutalized by those who profess to protect you. In fact, they protect capital. They protect private property. 
those who are owned by capital have no state protection. The property classes leverage state violence to discipline, repress, and contain them. America fears and despises all four people. But it reserves a special hatred, a distinctive form of violence for poor black and brown people. Poor black and brown people are the primary victims of American capitalism, but they are not just victims. Many of the people who have taken to the streets in Ferguson, for example, are exercising their human right to revolt against fascism. Many of these people are poor people, so they're not just victims. Right? They're agents, potentially agents of change. These insurgents demonstrated their power, their will to resist. They are the vanguard of the anti-racist insurgency. They are the vanguard of the anti-racist insurgency. They are on the front lines. They are confronting capital and its running dogs, the racist police. They have few illusions about the nature of the local police force. Though they pay taxes, they know the police do not work for them. They recognize, by and large, that the police are mercenaries for the corporations and for the rich. Politics of protest is what I'm talking about. Negotiation, appeals to authorities, versus the politics of rebellion, the politics that's being carried out on the streets of Ferguson, an attempt to inflict pain on a fascist system. What is the legitimacy? What is the legitimacy of the politics of violence? You, you know that violence is a politics, right? It is not merely catharsis or irrationality. It's not merely nihilism. The statement, fuck the police, is one of the most astute, honest, and meaningful responses to the events in Ferguson. <coughs> fuck authoritarianism and white supremacy. This is an uncompromising politics, a politics of resistance, based on an uncompromising critique that stems from a basic recognition of an unjust disparity of power. So the folks on the streets are talking about power relations, power relations. From here, and I'm wrapping up, sister. Where do anti-racists go from here? How do we build solidarity? How do we build resistance? We gotta move beyond these bureaucratic solutions. I know we're bureaucrats. I know that we're being conditioned and trained to act as good bureaucrats. But we must, if we're serious about confronting this problem of white supremacy, this systemic problem, we've got to move beyond these bureaucratic solutions. This is potentially an Emmett Till moment for your generation, potentially. This is not the last black body in the street. This is not the last black body since Mike Brown. There have been more black bodies. In, like I said, every 28 hours. But potentially, for whatever reason, for confluence of reasons, this could be the event that sparks the consciousness of your generation, that rouses you from your stupor, that gets you up off your knees. How do we define radicalism? Well, I define radicalism with my sister, Ella Baker. Ms. Baker said that uh, radicalism is getting to the root of a problem, right? Getting to the root of the problem. The slaughter of black and brown people by cops is a result of necessity of a system of white supremacy. White supremacy as a system is inextricable from the system of capitalism, imperialism, militarism, and the systems of the carceral state, mass imprisonment. Systemic problems do not call for superficial reforms or concessions. They call for transformation. They call for a new system. This does not necessarily mean that in order to be in the vanguard, we need to go down to Ferguson. Although, from what I hear, the brothers and sisters down there could use some backup. What it means is conflict.
confronting white supremacy wherever we are, wherever we are. Rather than asking what we will demand from the authorities, perhaps we should concentrate on the demands that we must make of ourselves. And, and by this, I don't mean that we're going to police our own behavior, right? So bourgeois, you know, politics and respect. We're not going to police our own behavior. But what I mean is, what do we ask of ourselves in terms of a living commitment, or rather living our commitment to the new society? What is our vision of the new society, and what are we willing to do to bring that vision into being? Which side are we on? Right? When we look at the TV screen and we see on one side the insurgents, the uprising, the people's uprising. And on the other hand, we see the violent apparatus of the state. Which side are we on? Which side are you on? Are we aiding and abetting the insurgency or the counterinsurgency, the crackdown? And if we are on the side of the insurgents, how do we intend to help build this insurgency? Right? This is the response that I'm calling for, that we must build this insurgency. Spontaneous, decentralized uprisings like the kind that will continue to unfold in Ferguson and elsewhere are a critical tool in the arsenal of a people's movement. But an uprising alone is not a movement. We need a sustained, long-term struggle against police terrorism and racist violence. We need to do something very difficult, in fact. Uh, we need to construct an anti-racist insurgency in a post-racial culture. We need to construct an anti-racist insurgency in the midst of a post-racial culture. How do we do this? Well, it, we might find it useful to build counter discourses, right? The importance of crafting our own language. We need a new lexicon. We need our own narratives and interpretive frameworks, self-definition, racial terror, police state, lynching, genocide will replace police brutality or the militarization of the police, something that's been much in the news. We're not just appealing to due process or to legal procedures, with apologies to my brilliant uh, colleague. We're charging genocide. We're charging genocide. This is a question of human rights. When you're denied the right to vote, that's a denial of civil rights, correct? When you cannot walk down the street as a black person without the threat of being attacked by terrorists, that's a violation of your humanity. That's a violation of human rights. You're being treated as subhuman. And you note that Darren Wilson said of Mike Brown, it looked like a demon. It looked like a demon. Because this is a human rights issue, we must put it in an international context. White supremacy, of course, is an international system. And our responses to it must also be internationals. I think it's very significant that during some of the Ferguson uprisings, one of the main groups of people to express solidarity and to give practical advice about dealing with tear gas, etc., were the residents of the occupied territories in Palestine. This is an international problem that demands international responses. We need campaigns of radical education, liberation pedagogy run by the oppressed for the express purpose of liberating the oppressed. We need creative, egalitarian, community-based methods of teaching and learning that reinforce the capacity of poor people and black and brown people to organize themselves and to engage in radical grassroots resistance struggles of their own design. By no means, and please get this, by no means will most black people and people of color participate in that struggle. By no means. In fact, most black people and people of color will refuse to participate. That is OK. You're not going to reach consensus among black people or brown people. You can't even reach consensus with five or six black folks. <laughs> The trick is to find your community. Find your community. Find activist-oriented people. 
Find the real anti-racists. They're out there. Don't look for allies. This word, allies. Look for comrades. Right? Look for comrades. And not all of them will be black or brown. Not all of them will be black or brown. Um, there's still a slender minority of white folks. It's very, very slender, but there's a slender minority of white folks that are ready to commit race suicide, which is to say they're ready to reject corrupt skin privileges. They're ready to perform treason to whiteness as an expression of their loyalty to humanity. We have to build counter institutions. We have to practice prefigurative politics. We have to practice the kind of social relations that we want to prevail in the new society that we envision and that we're struggling to build. We have to inflict pain on the system. We have to inflict pain on the system. We have to make the system suffer. We have to practice a politics of confrontation and open dissent. Without knowing the basic principle of seeing a human being who's walking, and they would even see an animal, he would not shoot the dog. He would not shoot the dog. Somebody walking a dog in the street with, he would not shoot. But it's okay to shoot a black man walking. When do we get the sanity back to all of us? Find that is in our collective interest to create the humanity, to respect the humanity of everybody walking around. So again, because of lack of time, I have chosen a few points here and there, and so uh, we can continue the conversation. Thank you. Current form, which is what produced mass incarceration, produced the carceral state, that Professor Ripper talked about, developed not uh, coincidentally, just as Jim Crow was in. And it, and it developed as a way to uh, um, identify them and empower the state to separate them from us and gradually give the state more and more power to uh, monitor, surveil, search, stop, uh, arrest, prosecute, convict, punish and execute those that the system designates as them. And those that the system designates as them in a post-Jim Crow era are overwhelmingly black and brown. If that's the ideology, what you're going to do is unleash the police in order to more effectively, more freely separate them from us. You will give the police more power. And when they exercise that power, you're not going to punish them because that conditions them not to exercise the power. So it's not a conscious thing, but at a subconscious level, for some it's conscious, clearly, but the conscious kind of racism that existed in the age of Jim Crow doesn't really, isn't evident anymore. What exists instead is a subconscious belief that the only way we will preserve order in this, in this society, and, and this is the critique that Professor Ripper is talking about, is to systematically separate them from us. And you create a set of rules that enables, first, you empower the state to do that, prosecutors and police, and judges and juries. And then you enable them by forgiving their errors rather than punishing them for their errors if you punish them they'll stop being aggressive. And what we most want them to do is keep us safe. The risk that you all run is being here ascending into the us, right? How, so the question is, how do we communicate the idea that there is no us? There is no them. There's only this community. And therefore, what you need to do is restrain the police in order to liberate the people. That's the thing that's never happened. That's uh, being uh, on the streets or on the sidewalk in itself, I mean, it's not an act of courage, like the much more courageous activity that is actually happening, and I hope continues, that is here at Cornell, that is like a leading university, to have a conversation with one another 
with your colleagues, with your professors, about the structures of oppression that are being perpetuated here. And I want to explicitly call out the, the Cornell students for justice in Palestine, who chose the most difficult target. They chose to protest the Technion partnership. And so you're all kind of part of this, because you're all kind of indirectly supporting that partnership. 